Welcome to The Leader's Mindset, where we have enlightening conversations with leaders of all kinds and all organizations, and we learn about how they became leaders, what the challenges they face are, and especially how they're developing the future leaders coming up behind them. I want you all to welcome our very special guest, a good friend of mine from way back. Way back. She is the Vice President of Investor Relations at the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. Please welcome Brooke Malone. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. I'm I'm so excited to catch up with you. And I know that you and I have had many discussions on leadership because that was what you were doing at United Way when we first met seven or eight years ago, yes. however long ago that was. So, so you are at LVGEA now. Yes. And not many people, well, I shouldn't say not many people, but a lot of people don't know what LVGEA is and how it's really having an impact on our community and our economy in Las Vegas. So tell us what LVGEA is what your role is there, and how you're trying to lead Las Vegas into the 21st century. Sure. So LVGEA, it's a very long acronym. It stands for the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. And our role is to help attract businesses to our community, to the community of Southern Nevada. So we are designated by the state of Nevada. There's eight of us total. Um, we are um, one of the largest, us in Reno, we're the two largest what we call EDOs, economic development organizations in the state. And our goal is to help diversify the economy. So here in Las Vegas, we are super fortunate because we have a big spigot of money coming in from gaming and hospitality, um, which is fantastic because I always say when we're up, we're up, right? Like when we have money coming in through that source of income, it is, it's amazing for us. However, when we go through a bus cycle in the economy, we are usually hit the hardest out of like large regions in the country. Typically Las Vegas is hit the hardest because what's the first thing people cut out of their budgets? Fun stuff. Right. Um, so the role of LVGEA is to help diversify the economy by way of bringing businesses here. And it's such a really, it's such a cool and unique organization because we have a chance to partner with a ton of different sectors, public sector, private sector. Our organization is a two-sector partnership, so public and private. Um, half of our funding comes from the state and municipalities. The other half of the funding comes from our private partners um, who really believe in making sure that Southern Nevada is successful in the way that we do business and have a well-running, functioning economy. And, and that's your job, is to build those partnerships with those private companies and bring those investor dollars in yes. to, help build, to help build the economy here in Las yes. Vegas. Yes, so very similar to what I was doing when I met you at United Way mm -hmm. of fundraising. I love fundraising so much, it's so much fun. I, I, um, looked, I looked at your resume on LinkedIn and I saw a lot of fundraising, so either yeah. you must really love it or be really good at it, or both. A little bit of both, I hope. Um, I've been doing it for so long since I was 19 years old. Um, but to me, fundraising is the art of telling a story and finding stakeholders who are interested in investing in that. So very similar, again, my role at LVGEA, I have an opportunity to identify companies who are interested in making sure that our region is successful and globally competitive in attracting businesses here. So yeah, it's fun. It's, it's really cool work. It is. So, so what kind of businesses are we trying to attract here? Because we are known for hospitality. Yes. We are known for gaming. We are yes. now getting known for sports and entertainment. Yes. What else are we trying to bring in? So when that, you know, that cycle always occurs, there's always an up and there's always a down. Mm -hmm. So, so how are we going to be less down the next time around? Yeah, less down. So focusing on a few different industries. And I'm so glad you're asking me this because one of our goals is to really help get the community rallied around making ourselves attractive to these types of industries. So the first one is battery. Um, of course, batteries, lithium are becoming huge in everything that we have between cars, devices. So here as a state, we're pretty uniquely positioned because we're so close to California. The natural resources that we have here, our climate is pretty unique. Um, the dry climate is actually to our benefit mm -hmm. in attracting a, a battery manufacturer here. So battery is one of them. Um, which falls under clean technology. Another one is fintech. So we actually have quite a few fintech companies in town and we're working to do more, especially with all of like the gaming and the sporting events that we have now. This is a prime place for a fintech company to come 
and set up shop because you have a great uh, audience. You have a worldwide global audience always coming in. And even when they're not coming in, the locals, it's, it's still an opportunity for them to test out what they have. Um, some of the other industries that we're going after include biotech. So healthcare for us is going to be huge. Uh, for one, because we have an aging population that's going to be coming up soon. The boomers are um, getting of age where they're going to need a lot of health care and support. So here in Southern Nevada, with the med school being here um, at UNLV, Roseman University, we have so many great resources here that we actually can be pretty competitive in that space. So those are some of the top three industries that we're going after right now. Okay, great. And it's not just big companies. And in the no. past, that's what the focus, the, my, what I understood was in the past, LVGEA was focused on how do we really bring big companies mm -hmm. here. You're starting to dive into fostering entrepreneurship, yes. bringing, bringing smaller companies, bringing those startups yes. here to Southern Nevada. So what kind of startups are you looking for and how are you bringing them here? How are you trying to get those those companies, how are you trying to get them now to move out of Silicon Valley or Austin and come join us here? Yeah, so a few ways. Um, one of them is actually it's like starting by listening to them. So what do you need? And what does our community not have that we can support you with? So together as an ecosystem, we can start to build those resources and bring them in to make ourselves um, fertile ground for them to plant themselves. That, so that's one area. Um, another area is bringing in experts. So I don't know that here in Southern Nevada, we, we, we just typically haven't had that type of background. So we've been working to identify partners who can help us in bringing in those types of companies and just identifying what other businesses they want to sell to. So in order for a startup to be successful, they have to have a customer base. Mm -hmm. And um, that customer base can tip either be another business or if it's B2C, like the consumer. So how can we build the infrastructure and a system to give them access to their customers easily. So those are some of the ways we're looking to build the entrepreneur space here. That's great. I'm so glad to hear you say that, that you're looking to bring expertise in and not yeah. just not just companies. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of mentoring with the startup community here in town, and I'm a, I'm a big believer that one of the things we really need are those those experienced mentors, those yes. exited founders yes. who have done it a couple of times, successfully or not. Yeah. Those those savvy investors who know how to help guide and mentor a startup founder. It's not it's not that we don't have great startup founders here, but Absolutely. we we don't know what we don't know sometimes. And I think I'm, I'm excited here. LVGEA is kind of in lockstep with the rest of us going. We really we need we need some expertise. We need some help here. We do, and we've been very fortunate here in our region because we've had some pretty big names come out of Silicon Valley. And at LVGEA, we've also been fortunate to connect with them. So recently we participated in something that was already going on prior to our involvement, but it's called the Vegas Tech Summit. Mm -hmm. You may be familiar with yep. Vegas Tech Summit, but um, the amount of billionaires that come to our region during that time is phenomenal. And the fact that we have access to those people and we can share the assets of our region and get their honest feedback on like what we are lacking. It's such, am I allowed to say bad words? It's the internet. You can say whatever okay, you want. Okay. It's such a badass opportunity for us. Um, and again, a I said a bad word. I'm so sorry. Um, it's such a, again, it, it's a really cool opportunity for us just because you have all these people who have experience in this area and they see a place like Southern Nevada where we don't necessarily have the experience. So I think we're all pretty porous and open to receiving their mentorship and their feedback. And I'm very grateful that at LVGEA, we're pretty, we're poised pretty well to take that in. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And I think LVGEA is really uniquely positioned to be the broker of that conversation. Yeah, and to, that's to, our goal. Yeah, that's, that's, goal. that's really great. Yeah. So how did we get to you being a vice president at LVGEA. How, how, Jason, where, where did we start? How did we get here? I want to do the same thing. I wake up trying to find my socks <laughs> matching in the morning. I've, I, I try to figure that out myself. Like, how did I become a vice president? That's a good question. Um, my story is different. I mean, like all of our stories, than probably a typical, what you would call executive or person in leadership. So pros and cons to everything, but I, I always tell this part of like my life because I think it's relevant to like who and how I am today. So I had my son very young. Mm -hmm. um, I had my kiddo the first day of second semester going back to UNLV. So I was like forced, like I had to get a job. 
fortunately, that job happened to be like a fundraising role. So I started out um, in a call center environment, but we actually had really cool clients like West Point Military Academy mm -hmm. and the Naval Academy out of Annapolis and universities and healthcare systems around the country. So I started off just like being a caller in a call center and pretty quickly the supervisors pulled me off the phone, um, the management and the owners and made me a supervisor. Mind you, I'm like 20, right? So I worked there for like a year, year and a half and I'm, I'm young, I'm in college, I got a kid. Um, and they were like, hey, you're really good at this. Like, you should help us train other callers. And I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm like, okay, like, I don't, I don't really know what that means, but I'll take it. Um, so pretty early on, I learned to read people, how to compel to others, how to tell someone else's story to help get others involved and feel passionate enough to want to give back and support. Um, and I've always just built on that momentum. So I started there. Um, I did an internship with American Red Cross. From there, I went to work at Habitat for Humanity. From there, I went to go work where you and I met at United Way. So I truly love the art and science of fundraising. And I, it, it's led me here. That's here incredible. we are. Yeah, we'll be looking for your master class on <laughs> fundraising and reading people. Fundraising and 101. So we'll be, uh, Jason LeDuc Leadership Consultants will be sponsoring that. <laughs> I love it. And you didn't just learn this all on the job. You actually studied media and communication for your for your college and your degree. I did. I did. Proud Sun Devil. Went to ASU. I call myself a cyber Sun Devil. So I went to school online through ASU's um, online journalism and media program. Cronkite graduate. Very proud. Um, but I will say, although I studied media and communications, a lot of what I learned was on the job. And I was recently listening to um, an interview with Jay Shetty and Adam Grant, and he said something that resonated so well with me and was so spot on because he said, the way we learn the best is when you, it's when we learn something and we have an opportunity to implement it immediately. Yeah. So because of my path, because I was in school, I mean, it took me eight to nine years to finish undergrad. So because, you know, I had like a human that I had to raise and um, and pay the bills and stuff. Priorities. <laughs> Priorities. Um, so I had a chance to go to school and work at the same time. Would not recommend teen parenting. However, um, because of my story and because I had to work full time and go to school full time, I would go to class and learn a concept and have an opportunity to implement it pretty immediately. And sometimes I have really cool professors. They would allow me to use my work as assignments. So for an example, I always am so grateful to a professor. She, we had like a press release assignment and I told her, I was like, hey, like I actually just wrote a, a real press release for Habitat for Humanity. Like we had a home build and a family just move in. Can I use that? And she was like, Absolutely. Please, like, please do. You sent yes. it to the media and they actually came outside. Yes, you can absolutely turn that in as your real work as your homework. So um, it was really cool having an opportunity to learn a curriculum put on by a phenomenal school and and be able to implement it at the same time. I, I've noticed that more and more. I did education in various parts of my career, starting yeah. as an undergraduate, as a teenager, yeah. and then going to the Air Force and doing a master's degree in engineering in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then finally, after I got out of the Air Force, doing my MBA at UNLV, and I did find over all those years that there was more and more emphasis on you can do real world stuff as your assignments. Yes. And I think that's that's really valuable when you can yeah. implement and reinforce what you're learning with something that you're actually doing and you're passionate about. Yeah, and I think that's when we learn the best, right? Like I think we learn the best. What is it called? Experiential learning or like tactile learning? When you just, like you just got to do it. That's, that's how yeah, we I should know what that's called, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the do it learning. You yeah. just got to do it. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. Well, when we first met, you were involved in doing a lot of leadership development stuff with the community through United Way. In addition yes. to the fundraising, that's that's one of the ways we really connected is over some events at United Way. Yeah. So, what have you learned about leadership in addition to in addition to what you've learned about learning and doing? What have you learned about leadership? And more importantly, because we really believe here that our number one job as leaders is to develop future leaders coming up behind us. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about leadership? But what have you learned about developing future leaders? Yeah, so something I've learned about leadership, there's a few key qualities that are important. I just finished reading Good to Great by Jim Collins. 
and he talks about humility. And when I think about some of the leaders that I admire, they absolutely have that trait of humility. In addition to having a vision, communicating that vision clearly to their people, they are humble. Also, a quality leader empowers others. My job as a leader is to make sure that everyone on my team, um, those who report to me, those who are my equals, those who are above me, can do the absolute best they can do. And any and everything that I can give them to support them in their work, I feel, I feel like that makes me and anyone around me who's aspiring to be a leader, like that makes you a quality leader, is making sure that everyone else around you is uplifted and you're giving them the tools and the resources they need to do the absolute best they can do and to learn. Learning is so important. Like, I think sometimes we undermine what it means to be a lifelong learner and learning just, that's why, you know, when you ask the question about school, like, yes, I, you know, proud grad of ASU. However, most of what I've learned has been outside of the classroom and continuing to grow is crucial to anyone's, to anyone's success as a leader. Yeah, we agree. We agree <laughs> with that here. So it's, uh, it's that lifelong learning piece is something that I think uh, a lot of leaders come to later. Yeah. They... Uh, because you're, when you're a young leader, you're always learning something new. And then you kind of get to a point where you go, okay, I, I got this figured out a little bit. Yeah. And then you realize, oh, I don't have this as figured out as, as well as I did. And we're always right. trying to push that lesson of keep learning because if you don't, you're, you're going to learn one way or the other. So Yeah. And to your second question around what do I do to empower my people? So that's it. I encourage my team to constantly learn more, like teach yourself something new, teach me something new. Um, and go outside, right? Like, don't just stay within our organization. Like, I encourage benchmarking. I, we've all heard that a sentiment that comparison is like the thief of joy. But I think like a healthy comparison can help boost your productivity. It can help boost your learning. Like, don't envy, you know, what someone else has have going on. But if you can look outside of your bubble and if you can look outside of your sphere and really understand what another organization or another person that you admire is doing, that is something I highly encourage my team to do, um, benchmarking and understanding what others are doing so we can make ourselves better. Yeah, it's uh, especially in what you're doing because those relationships are so important. Yeah. Right, so looking outside, building relationships outside, and mm -hmm. really starting to develop a more strategic view of your own job yeah. is really important to start thinking about what 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 is my boss's problems, what can I help with? Mm -hmm. What are my boss's, boss's problems that I can help with? Absolutely. How does, how does uh, if you're in a, in a for-profit company, how, do you, how does our industry work? Not just how does our company work? How, exactly. does, how, does our, how do our customers' industries work? Mm -hmm. And developing that strategic big picture knowledge yep. is really important. That's huge, it's so important. And also, um, when we teach others, it helps us learn more as well. Um, and I, I always encourage my team to, and myself for mm -hmm. that matter, to listen more, listen more than you speak, right? So two ears, one mouth for a reason, right? So always, Absolutely. I think, you know, we hear about critical thinking, um, speaking clearly, but to me, listening clearly and listening critically is just as important, if not more important than yeah, it was just as important. I wouldn't say it's like less, less or more important than thinking critically, but listening critically and clearly is also just as I, important. I think it's fair to say that the that the core skill set of communicating is the listening part. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the piece you've really got to have, and the mm -hmm. critical thing. You know, listening critically is if you want to uh, manage conflict and if you want to yes. have win win solutions. The listening and understanding piece is really the core competency of the, that kind of communication. Yep, absolutely. All right, so you took a break from the fundraising for a while. I did. You went and worked for a tech startup. I did. Tell me all about that. Do I have to? You do. I'm just kidding. Um, it was fun. I had such a great time, and it was nice to go outside of what I know. Um, really cool how I came across the company. I was actually at United Way. I was working, and one of my colleagues comes um, – 
he calls me into the conference room. And I'm like, dude, I got to go. I'm late for a meeting. Like I'm already, I'm, I'm late. I, I got to go. I he's remember like, how no, fast paced. Remember how like fast. I remember how it was. Yeah. Um, and I, he's like, you got to meet this founder. And I was like, I don't have time. Tell him I'll talk to him later. Like I got to go. Um, and he was like, no, seriously, like you got to meet him. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I go and meet him. I end up like super late for my meeting because I am just overwhelmed with excitement and the vision that he expressed in such a short amount of time, like really sucked me in to um, want to be a part of it. So for a few weeks, actually probably like a couple months, he kept telling me like, hey, Brooke, I'm hiring for this position. And I was like, oh, great. Like I know some people, like I'll send them your way. I'll send you resumes. I'll, you know, send the, it's like send me the job description. I'll forward it. So one day he says, hey, can I take you out to lunch? I'm like, yeah, for sure. And he slam. we're at Bonefish Grill in Town Square, I'll never forget. He slams his portfolio on the table and he goes, Brooke, I want you to work for my company. I was like, oh, you want me to work for your company? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, wait, let me see that job description again. Like, what do you need me to do? And I was like, ah, like I'm a fundraiser. I don't know if I can do this. And um, what did they have you doing? Sales. Sales. So, which yeah. is, I mean, fundraising is sales, yeah. right? So, but again, I didn't want to say no because I was about to graduate when I took on the role. So I was about three months out from graduation when I took on the role. And I was willing and open to trying new things. Also, I found it was very similar to fundraising. So it was the art of creating a story as to why this founder made this business. It was in a sector that I'm incredibly passionate about, which is education, specifically higher education, mm -hmm. and giving students access to resources that they may not otherwise have great experience. One of the most brilliant men I know, um, the founder, uh, Gerald Meggett of the company's called Circle Inn. He's so smart. He actually, I read pretty, well, I think I read pretty often now. And one of the reasons I read so often is probably because of him. He mm -hmm. sometimes would read like a book a week. And I'm like, how are you doing this and working like 80 hours and running a company, but having an opportunity to work under him, we had to hustle hard. We had fun. We went from, you know, two schools to 20 schools and within like a year, I had an opportunity to visit lots of states and cities and meet with provosts and presidents and deans and learn how they are aspiring to make sure that their students can access, excuse me, access uh, the tutoring center and other resources to help them on their journeys um, and getting through their education. So having an opportunity to be a part of that was super cool and fun um, until it wasn't. And it wasn't because like it, the company was bad. It, it's a great company. The founder is just as amazing. The team is amazing. However, being a mom, it was really hard. I was on flights and in hotels and meeting with people. There were days that I was in three states in one day and having meetings in like three different states, like flight flight hotel and it was tough on me. So I had to take a step back. Like the founder and I like mutually agreed that I would take a step back um, from the company. He's still doing amazing things. He's getting kids tutoring and access to resources to this day. Um, but something I learned from that experience was um, to be adaptable because things are going to change and you have to be flexible enough to take on that change and still move forward regardless, which I've worked for the company prior to the pandemic. So having that type of skill set <laughs> built before this pandemic was really helpful because um, when things changed rapidly during the pandemic, I had already built some grit mm -hmm. around um, change and not being so frazzled by when things are different. Yeah. Startup life can be demanding. It's hard. Yeah. It, like, so, you know, you, you know, you hear about the stories about like Facebook and how these founders are, like in their dorm rooms, like at these crazy hours. I was like, oh, that's a real thing. This is like, this is real. Like the engineers are over there eating pizza. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to eat a salad, but it, like, I, I can't stay up. I mean, it is, it is demanding. Yeah. It's very demanding. So what, what did you take from startup life? How does that help you with what you're doing at LVGEA and help LVGEA, especially in their efforts to foster entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I would say um, adaptability. So having the, um, being, fl being flexible enough to change. So 
An organization like LVGEA, fortunately we are not, but an organization like ours that has a lot of uh, government partnerships can become very complacent. We are fortunate to have a leader who does not allow or go for that. Um, she's very open to change, and I encourage my team to um, like stick to, stick to what you know and give space for learning new things and adopting those new things when we see that it can be a better practice to what we're already doing. So I think something my major, one of my biggest takeaways from being in the startup space was just being flexible, like giving yourself some space uh, for change and uh, developing grit, like just, just keep going. Don't be afraid to try, don't be afraid to fail. Yep. Just pick yourself up and keep what going. What is it, fail right? forward? Yeah, yeah fail, fail forward. forward. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, you mentioned your boss a little bit. Yes. But, uh, and, and if that's the answer to this question, that's great. But uh, who is someone you admire as a leader? Yeah, so her. She's uh, Tina Quigley. She is, she's amazing. She's amazing. She's a rock star. Um, I, I love working with her. She actually brought in someone who I also admire as a leader. Um, you may be familiar with him. His name's Jeremy Aguero mm -hmm. of Applied Analysis. And... I was really excited to work with him because if you've ever seen Jeremy Aguero speak, he is such a dynamic speaker. And I tell folks, he has the exact same energy off stage that he does on stage. Like that is not an act. That is not a facade. Like he is really like that. So I was really excited to work with him. Um, and we, we worked together for almost six months. And I will tell you the first 30 days of that six months, I had a complete 180. I was like, I do not like this man. I never want to work with him again. And this is terrible. Reason being is because now that like now that I'm coming back to look at it, mm -hmm. he does not allow mediocrity, mm -hmm. mediocrity. He does not allow complacency. There is no space for half ass. There is no space for, well, I kind of sort of did my best. Mm -hmm. No, you are going to do your best. And at the time, that was so uncomfortable because our organization had gone through a lot of change. And uh, my colleague and I, we, we, we kind of have this saying where we say, apply pressure and give space for grace. And when I think about who embodies that type of motto, it's Jeremy Aguero. He brings out the best in everyone around him. He, if you spend just an hour with that man, he will ask you incredibly thoughtful questions. He's going to do his research. And when I think about the type of leader that I want to be, how prepared he is, that is who I want to be. And um, lucky enough, I have an opportunity to connect with him a few times throughout the year. Um, and every time I meet with him, I walk away with something so valuable. And when I think about the type of leader that I want to be when I grow up, <laughs> um, he's definitely someone that I think of. And of course, my boss, Tina Quigley, she's amazing. She's killer at collaborating. She, the way she can bring people together to solve a problem just blows my mind. I kind of think she's like the godfather a little bit too, though. And you think there's like, a little bit, little bit of that like going a, on there? Yeah, like a little bit. I don't know. Can, not a, not unusual here in no, Las Vegas. No, no, but like no, she she's amazing. She she like she excites me, and she, the way she can get people inspired to accomplish something, and you know, a group of people may be thinking like, "There's no way in hell we're gonna get that done." She'll pose questions, plant some seeds for thought. And by the time everyone's walking away, we're like, yes, we can do this. Um, so the way she inspires is something I aspire to do um, within my career. And I hope I, it's something I embody so far working with her. But she is the, if I can like combine two people, I would combine uh, Jeremy Aguero and Tina Quigley and like one human. And if I can be that type of leader, that would make me very happy. That's fantastic. I love how you brought up how she's inspiring and building bridges because mm -hmm. that's my next question for you. So there are a lot of, interest and in stakeholders in the economy here in Southern Nevada, and they don't always agree on the best path forward. Yeah. How, how does LVGEA and your team work to help get those interests aligned and keep people moving towards this transformational economy we're looking for? Yeah. So Jason, you'd be surprised. They, so again, when you ask that question, I immediately think about gaming and hospitality. However, they are pretty on board 
with the industries that we are trying to attract. So when we were developing the industries that we were going after to help diversify our economy, of course we wanted to lean into our strengths. Um, so you can't hide from what we have here, right? The, the support that we get from gaming, hospitality, sports and entertainment, we wanted to build on that. So with that, they're pretty supportive of the industries that we have coming here. So when you think about an industry, an industry like FinTech, um, if a gaming company has access, better access, closer proximity to um, a digital payment provider or some type of like digital wallet, all the better for them. Same with sports and entertainment, right? When you think about biotech, sports medicine, sports tech, we have all of the resources you could imagine when it comes to having professional sports, collegiate sports here. So it works out pretty well for them. Um, whenever we have someone who is not on board, an organization not on board, it's helpful for us to just present the data. Um, people can wiggle a story, but numbers don't lie. So presenting the information um, in terms of numbers, potential, what it could do for our community and our economy, that's usually how we can help people get in line with what we're doing. Yeah, having numbers that show the upside yes. to get involved is is certainly hard to argue with. Yeah. So let's talk about your team. Yeah. You've got a team now. I do. They're, they're doing great stuff for you. Tell us about your team. How did you find them? Did you bring them on? Were they pre-existing? Yeah, so I inherited partially. So I partially inherited my team and uh, brought someone else on. So this is a misconception about LVGEA. With the interns, we are a team of 14. We're pretty small. Um, like when I think about a lean team, I mean, I think about us. Like we are a pretty tight team. Um, so I had, it's myself, my colleague Jason, who runs our events and our um, administrative assistant, who's like the Wonder Woman who really makes everything happen. Um, Dawn, she's great. She's in college, she's hungry. Love having her on the team. Like when I think about someone who's gonna be a lifelong learner, like mm -hmm. I, I think about her, she's asked great questions, she's great. Um, so, and we, Jason and I brought her on. So my team, we have been able, I believe, help, we've been able to help the organization grow in a way that they haven't historically because we've helped break down silos. So when I started at LVGEA, uh, previous leadership was great. Um, however, like, like we, the team, the, the overall organization was like, we were siloed. And because of the work of our current leadership, Tina, and my colleagues who have recently come on, we've really been able to break down those silos, um, encouraging everyone to speak up. Like if you have something to say, speak up. If you see an opportunity for growth within someone else or within our processes, like speak up and say something. And I think that's what's made our team strong is that we we're, we're just honest with each other and we trust each other enough to know that no matter what, we want what's best for the organization and what's best for our organization ultimately becomes what's best for this community. Um, so I, I got a great team. I am, I feel like I say this word a lot, grateful, but I am, I'm just, I'm so grateful. I have a really, I have a great team. Well, that's a, a great attitude I think for a leader to have is yeah. to be grateful for the people who are there supporting the mission and supporting the people getting the mission done. Yeah. How do you view your role as the leader of that team? Oh my gosh. It's so, it's so funny you say that because I always say like, uh, technically the person who reports to me, I always say like, Jason's in charge. His <laughs> name's Jason as well. I always say he's in charge. Can, can never go wrong putting Jason can in charge. Can never go wrong putting Jason in charge. Um, how do I view myself as the, the say the question one how more time. How do you view your role as, the lead, as a leader? I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier around allowing my team to learn new things and encouraging them and giving them the resources they need to do the best job they can do. So, and that's that's just not, you know, Jason, it's not just with my team. We, because we're such a small group, our organization isn't that large, although we have a large impact, like the actual employees in the organization just isn't that big. Um, giving, it is so important for me to give my team what they need because I know when I give Jason what he needs, he's going to execute flawlessly. The same thing with Dawn. I know when I give Dawn, when I give her clarity and when 
I give her the resources that she's asking for, she's going to execute exactly what we need to get done. And I view my role as that facilitator of providing that stuff, whether it's information, whether it's access to another person, whether it's a conversation with another leader on our team, making sure that the folks who report to me have what they need to do their jobs well, like that, that is my job. Like, I know we've heard a lot about service leadership Mm -hmm. and it's true. Like my job is to serve my team and that's how I view my role. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you have a really scrappy bunch of folks, a small, small, but mighty team. Yeah. And I, I hear a lot of, great qualities like initiative and accountability Mm -hmm. in the word, you know, reading between the lines a little bit, that you've got a great team that believes in that. And they're doing, they're doing great things for all of us, even though there's only a few of them. Yeah. So at LVGEA, everyone who's there really wants to be there. And you have to be when you work in an organization where you have, we have a board of 60, we have 60 board members, countless stakeholders in the community that include the governor's office of economic development, um, all of the local municipalities, the mayors, they serve on our board, the higher education presidents and executives of for-profit companies in town. Um, when you have that kind of, like those set of eyes on you, you, it is so important to have a team who wants to deliver to the community and we have that. That's great. It's not just like my role in investor relations and events. It's our business attraction team, our client services team, government affairs, every aspect of the business and what we do, they take initiative and they have their own intrinsic drive to get something done. So it's a matter of us all deciding like essentially like what the most important thing is to accomplish and we're going to get it done. That's great because that intrinsic drive, that is, it's not that you can't teach it, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's something that's it could be a long, painful process to develop someone to have that drive. Yeah. And I think, you know, I believe maybe not 100%, maybe like 80%, 80, 85%. That is something that has to be self-developed. Like you have to, you have to get that within yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm going to go back to Adam Grant. He just came out with this book that I haven't read yet, but it's called Hidden Potential. Mm Mm-hmm. And from what I could hear so far regarding like the reviews and the summary, it talks about uncovering what's already there. So a lot of people that I've come across at least, um, they already have it within them. It's just up to you as a leader to dust off the extra and the access and get them to what's already within them and help it shine. Well, it sounds like you're doing that. I hope so. My team may tell you the opposite. I don't know, Jason. (laughs) I hope (laughs) I am. We'll get them on next time. Yeah, we'll get them on, see how they really feel. We'll do a panel. Yeah. All right, will you play a game with me? Of course I will. All right. This game is called Rapid Response. Ooh, okay. Uh, So I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, let me get my And you're going to tell me the first thing that pops into your head, okay? Okay. We're going to do it quickly. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Brooke Malone, Rapid Response. Your time starts now. A book everyone should read. Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck. Okay. Best way to spend the holidays. With family and food. All right. And drinks. And drinks. Next vacation. Alaska. Oh, good one. An important trend we should all be watching. AI. Okay. Favorite sports team. Professional? Collegiate? It's up to you. LA Lakers. Oh, I wasn't expecting that one. (laughs) All right. A podcast recommendation. How rapid is my rapid response? These are digital cameras. We'll just keep going, so. Let's see. Ah, there's so many good ones. You know, I... So it recently stopped, but Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. That's Although a good one. all of the episodes are like stale. Not stale, they're still relevant, but she stopped recording yeah, it. That's a good one. Yeah. And this one, of course. Think think carefully about this one. Okay. The best Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner side dish. Listen, I'm gonna have to go with like the holy grail trio. 
It's not one. Okay. It has to be a combo of the Mac, the greens, and the candied yams. You got to like have them all like touching a little bit on the plate mm-hmm. and you got to like eat it at the same time. That is like the perfect side. That's that's well, why like p- maybe like a little crumble of cornbread right there. Yeah, that's why people tune into this podcast so they can get their <laughs> their dinner strategy tips it's just, it's from a strategy. our guests. Yeah, yeah. Besides AI, something we should all be paying attention to, or someone. Each other. Each other. Ooh, good answer. All right, you get a choice here. Okay. Either your get psyched up song or your walk on music. Ooh. And it could be the same one. Next episode by Dr. Dre. Oh, okay. Finally, last question. Your biggest influence in life. Oh. People. 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 People in general. People in general. That's great. Very, very human of you. (laughs) So we talked about what's going on with LVGEA today. Yes. And the things you're trying to achieve today. Yeah. What's the long-term vision that LVGEA has and how are you how are you taking the steps to get there? That is a great question. So you're going to have to like talk to me in about 4 weeks. We are um, in the process of working through the EOS system, EOS um, the Entrepreneur Operation System mm-hmm. by Gino Wickman. And we're in the midst of putting together our 10-year vision, our 10-year plan. Here's what, I, here's what I think we're going to go in the direction of. You've heard us at LVGE. If you've ever attended any of our events or like heard any of our content, we talk a lot about what I said today, diversifying the economy. It's our role. It's our job. Um, but it's also making sure that every stakeholder in this community has a role and a place in making sure that we are successful in doing that. Something that our organization has a responsibility to this community around is helping them recognize that the success of our economy, the success of the quality of life for our neighbors, it's up to us. So I, I think, and I, I could be wrong, um, and I'm sitting in on these sessions, so I hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when I think about our 10-year vision and like our long-term plan, it's really going to be around making sure we have a successful economy, but and making sure that those who matter and who are participating in that economy have a place that makes them successful. That's very uh, good to great of making yeah. sure everybody's in the right seat on the bus. Yes. Come on, Jim Collins. Yeah. I hear you. Great book. I like that. <laughs> so in your role, your team's good at what they're doing today. What are you going to have to do to help develop your team to meet that that challenge for that to meet to achieve that ten year plan? Uh, learn something that Tina has encouraged all of us to do is become expert in our area. So I mentioned to you some of the industries that we're going after. So I didn't say all five of them. I can say all five of them now. So um, biotech, healthcare sports technology slash medicine, um, corporate headquarters, fintech, and which one did I miss? The first one. I thought uh, that battery. was five. No, battery. Oh, battery. Okay. Um, battery. So something that she's encouraged the individuals within our organization who's responsible for those industries and attracting those sectors is to become, is to become the local expert. Um, like, the person who is leading our battery technology initiative and effort, like he needs to be the local go-to expert. So that means him tapping into the current experts, reading absolutely any and everything he can get his hands on, um, understanding the trends and what's coming in the future. So, and I encourage my team to do the same. So actually my team member, my Jason, he's Mm -hmm. gonna be going out to Kansas City this week because um, the Kansas City Area Development Council, which is the LVGEA of Kansas City, they are planning an event that we aspire to reach like the same number. So our our biggest event, we'll have about like 800, almost 900 people there. Um, they have 2,000 people in Kansas City. And I'm like, if Kansas City can do that, Las Vegas certainly can. Yeah. So um, sending the team out to understand um, what's working and adopting 
principles, practices that will work well in our region. I think that's what's going to take us to the next level is I, I, so it goes back to learning. Oh my gosh. I just like ding light bulb just went off it, it, learning. So in order for us to get to the next level, we all need to continue learning, learning and it growing. Sounds great. And Kansas city is a great example to learn from. They've been doing this a long time they and they have an incredible, uh, both an incredible corporate ecosystem, but also an they incredible do. startup ecosystem yes. too. And we're in the entrepreneur community here. We're trying to learn a lot from places like Kansas city and, Tulsa, Oklahoma and Oklahoma yep. City, they're, they've been doing it a long time and they're doing really great. So Yeah. And you know, they also, so especially when you mentioned a place like Tulsa, they have incentives, um, like state incentives, state municipal incentives that are geared toward attracting entrepreneurs. And we currently don't have that. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to take us going back and looking at what we currently offer to companies and making sure that we make ourselves competitive to attract those types of startups here. And maybe there's something we can learn from Kansas City and Oklahoma and adopt it here. Well, we'll check back with you uh, yeah. in a few weeks when your 10-year plan is Yeah, when our 10-year plan is done, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> what is one of the best mistakes you've ever made and what did you learn from it? Yeah. One of the best mistakes I made, Jason, this is going to sound so silly. I learned it very early on when I was 16 years old. So my first job, mm -hmm. Cold Stone Creamery, best job ever. Okay, I'm a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. I'm in student government and I work at Cold Stone. So like I'm just excited all the time. Um, cool job, like making good money, making tips. And this girl and I, and like I'm not really like prone to like, confrontation with folks but this girl and I we like get into a confrontation at work it like cinnamon and caramel sauce was involved like throwing it around I was 16 years old this person she started it like she started the I confrontation I ended it <laughs> um and I got fired and she did not and when I reflect on that moment, it's so funny because my girlfriends are always like, Brooke, that was like 20 years ago. Let it go. Um, which is true. I, I have since let it go. But something I learned very early on was that you never allow someone to take you out of your element. So I made a mistake by retaliating and like throwing cinnamon and caramel after she like <laughs> threw cinnamon and caramel on me. But when the owners reached out to me to, to fire me at the age of 16, I was devastated. It was my first job. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seriously devastated. Um, they said, you know, I'm wow. Sorry. I just thought about this. They said, Brooke, like you are the, like she had only been working there for a couple months. You were the leader in this situation. You had tenure, you set the expectations. So even if someone does something wrong, you don't double up their wrong with another wrong. Mm -hmm. And that fortunately I learned that behind a cold stone versus like in a, in a boardroom. Um, that's a, that's a lesson some leaders never actually learn. So yeah. it's great to learn that one early. Yeah, I learned it early with caramel sauce and cinnamon. Um, but I, that seriously has stuck with me early on. And even to this day, when I deal with folks, like folks in pretty authoritative positions who do something that's probably not right, um, I don't. I wouldn't say that I, like, I, I exactly think it about throwing cinnamon or caramel on them. But I do think about keeping my integrity in place and my morale intact, allowing them to behave the way they behave, but um, just having a response that embodies and encompasses like who I know I am as a person and what needs to get done and don't like do something negative to top something else that was negative. Yeah, it's really important to live up to the kind of leaders we say we want to be. Yeah. And that's a really good example of that. Yeah, yeah. Don't throw caramel sauce and cinnamon on people. Like, for first time on this podcast, <laughs> we talked about a caramel and caramel sauce and cinnamon fight. Yeah. And probably Hope the so. last. Rancho we'll Cucamonga. <laughs> Rancho <laughs> Victoria Cucamonga. Victoria Gardens. <laughs> is that place still there? It is. It I is. might need to take a trip and yeah. say, this is the place. This is the place. This is where it went down. Yeah. So what is an accomplishment that you are particularly proud of? An accomplishment? Does my kid count? Yeah. If you're Okay. He's cool. <laughs> I got a kid. He's cool. <laughs> I'm proud of him. Cool. Um so oh God, I hate to be that person who's like, I'm so proud. But 
I'll give you like a real one that's like work related. But uh, I will say one of the reasons I'm super proud of my kid is because he is so kind and not like in a way that like people take advantage of him. Like, but he is just like a, a genuinely nice person. I've had teacher, I had a teacher come up to me in tears, Jason. Mm-hmm. And I, she actually made me cry too. She was like, are you Brenton's mom? And based on where we live, I was like, lady, who else's other mom would I be? Like, do you see these other kids in this classroom? Who else's mom am I, lady? I didn't say that, that's what I was thinking. Um, But I was like, yeah, like, he's my kid. Like, maybe he's my kid. Like, why would he do? And she was like, he's so polite. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Opens the door for people. And she just listed off all of these other behaviors. And I was having a really crappy day. So to have that woman stop me in the parking lot and tell me um, that I'm doing a halfway decent job of raising this human that at, during the same time when I was like raising myself, um, that felt really good. So I don't know if that counts as an accomplishment. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say so. <laughs> I'm pretty, he's a pretty cool dude. I'm proud yeah. of him. You don't have to come up with a work-related one. I think. Okay, cool. I, I think we'll that, leave it to I think Brenton. that takes the cake on that yeah. one. But again, another thing that some some leaders, some folks never learn that lesson about being kind and doing it just for the intrinsic value of being kind, yeah. not to get something. And and the fact that your son has already learned and embraced that lesson. I mean, you're, yeah. you're doing something right. So I hope so. You may have to have him on. He may tell you otherwise. I don't know. We're always looking for guests. So. <laughs> he may so tell does, you something Does else. he know the caramel sauce and cinnamon story? He does not, and he will not. Okay. We're going to skip this part, that part okay. of the, the interview. We don't like to cut out parts of our podcast. <laughs> I'm just going to some, fast Sometimes forward. we will. Fast forward that part. Okay, let's shift gears back into the nuts and bolts of work. Okay. What are some of your favorite work tools, digital or otherwise, that you can't live without? Ooh, my favorite work tools. My calendar. My calendar runs my life. Um, yeah, I cannot live with, like, if it's not on the calendar, it is not a real Same thing. Here. Um Outlook's not my favorite. Like, tell Bill Gates to holla at me. Um, but I'm sure he's watching. Yeah, he's totally watching. Um, the calendar, what else can I not live without? I still walk around. You know those yellow pencils that have, like, the twisty thing at the bottom? Do you know oh, what I'm talking like, about? Like a mechanical pencil? Well, yeah, a mechanical pencil, but not the ones that you press. Right, you, like, the ones turns. that you twist yeah. at the mm-hmm. bottom. Like, the, the yellow ones, the old school ones. That. I love walking around with my pencil. Like, I don't like using a pen. I like I like pencils. Okay. I think I have one in my purse, actually. Seriously. I, I believe you. <laughs> no, no, no reason to challenge you on that. Yeah, my pencil on my calendar. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. It's not very fancy. I wish I That's had okay. more. They, I'm a simple they, girl. They, they don't need to be fancy. We're just trying to, we're trying to give leaders and entrepreneurs out there and folks some advice on how we're doing our jobs and yeah. you know, sometimes the simple answers are the best writing pencil instead of pen. Yeah. Writing pencil. Yeah. Pens, pencils usually don't let me down. So you know what? Actually one more thing. Um, thank you cards. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that falls into the category, but best answer I've heard so far. I send out a lot of thank you cards and hand. So because we send so much digitally, usually um, when folks receive something handwritten, in pen. I do use pens for my cards. I don't use pencils. I wasn't um, going to judge you. <laughs> if I did, maybe yeah. I'll start using pencil. Um, that means a lot to folks. So I'm going to go with my calendar, my twisty mechanical pencil, and thank you cards. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. What is or who is someone or something that shaped your views on leadership that you have today? My boss at United Way, Angel Williams. So I don't, do you remember Angel? I do, I ran into her, she's with Nevada Energy now. Energy now, now. yeah. yeah. And, uh, I ran into her uh, at a, she was doing a uh, hiring, she was there, it was a hiring event for oh, veterans. Cool. And I was there representing Vets in Tech. So we ran into each other. Oh, and, super cool. And the last time I saw her was I think the last day that I saw you. Oh so, wow, yeah. well there you go. I uh, see both of us uh, recently here. So, something Angel taught me and not that like she, she didn't like sit me down and, you know, write it out on a board or we didn't have like a formal meeting about it. But something that she showed me is that you don't have to be in a role of authority to be a leader. So 
we know folks who are in authoritative roles that lack leadership skills. And we also know folks who are maybe not in those roles and they have strong leadership skills. And the way she taught me that was by sharing with me like, hey, Brooke, folks to you, like whether you realize it or not, folks to you in this organization and outside of this organization really look up to you. And here are some of the things you should do to prepare yourself. Um, and here are some things that you can do in the future to ensure that others around you have an opportunity to learn and grow with you. And some of the lessons that she taught me really helps me understand that just because I'm not a director yet, just because I'm not a vice president yet, doesn't mean that I cannot be a leader. So I'm really grateful for the time that I spent with her because she was not shy about pointing out my flaws, but I always knew it was with a heart of gold. It was because she wanted to make me better. And again, when I think about the type of leader that I wanna be, I often think about her um, when she was leading our team at United Way because she is another one who helped bring out the best in others. Mm -hmm. um, she called us to the carpet when we needed to be called to the carpet, but it was always with pure intention and it was always solutions driven. Um, so I really value that lesson that she taught me. That's fantastic. And now yeah. you're sharing those lessons with your team. Yeah. Again, I think so. I hope I am, Jason. We'll, we'll send out a survey. Yeah, let's do that. We'll get some feedback. So you do have a lot of responsibility now as yeah, a vice president. I do. And one of the things we like to talk about here, because leadership is not always easy. No. What are the things that keep you up at night? What are the really significant challenges with your role at LVGEA and what you all are trying to bring into the world right now? bring to Las Vegas, what, what's on your mind? What, what are those challenges? So I'm gonna use a word that's commonly used in the space of economic development and then break it down. Um, it's regionalism. So some of the things that have held us back before when we're talking about getting federal grants or accomplishing a grand goal is not collaborating. And it is incredibly important to me that our partners know that they have a place in this work, whether it's like directly tied to like their municipality or their mission or um, what they think, like if they think they're just like in a certain part of this bucket, like all this is an ecosystem and everything works together. So when I say regionalism, I mean the act of collaborating together as a region. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that keeps me up as, at night is because I understand the power of collaboration and partnership and anything that anything great that's been done has been done together. And I know that if we don't get our act together, we will continue to be outperformed by other communities that may not have as much as we have to offer. But if we can put our disagreements to the side, and come together for the sake of building something bigger and greater, it can happen. So I would say when I think about what keeps me up at night or what concerns me, it's, uh, it's togetherness, collaboration. And, and, that, and that's what like, keeps me going is like getting people together. Yeah, and it's, it's something traditionally we have not been good at mm -hmm. in this valley yeah. and in Southern Nevada. And I've, I've lived a lot of places. Mm -hmm. I've never lived in a place where the the boundaries that people play, those arbitrary lines that people draw yeah. on maps, where where they are, um, they're they're so unimportant to what we do. Everything, they're they're just they really are just lines on a map here. Yeah. There are there are a couple of lines on a map just a couple blocks from here, right? Mm -hmm. But all of our lives go on going back and forth forth mm -hmm. across that line, and that's those lines, and that's. I'm glad LVGEA and you are, and you are in particular, are thinking about those things and how we collaborate to to get across those lines together. Yeah, it's it's important for us. So again, when you're talking about um, changing an economy for the better and building a quality of life that is attractive to workforce and business, it takes togetherness. Like that is not something LVGEA can like can or should do alone. That's my next question: is yeah. where where do you and LVGEA need help with that? Oh, thanks for asking. So I'm going to get like a little technical for a minute. 
um, part of our action plan is to build the Vegas business brand, lead business attraction, so the act of recruiting businesses to come here and create value for our investors. And when I think about that first goal within our action plan is building the Vegas business brand, we all have to do a better job of having community pride. So believing in ourselves, something I love that all of our sports teams have done for us is really bring us together and make us proud. Um, for so long, we've our own publications and newspapers have talked about essentially how like how our education system sucks. Like we suck, our education sucks, um, but we don't do so good of a job highlighting the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So if we all can help amplify our voices around the positive things, um, that doesn't mean that you you know you're not putting lipstick on a pig. Right. You're not saying that the bad stuff doesn't exist and that we're not gonna and that we we can't make it better because we can. Like let's talk about the the bad stuff. But when we talk about it, like come to me with a solution. Don't come to me with a problem without coming to me with a solution. So when we bring up these challenges that we have in our education system, our healthcare system, housing, homelessness, anything else, like we have to come prepared with answers or at least ideas and thoughts on how to solve those problems. So where we can need, where we need the most help is building and amplifying the business brand. And what are the great things about living here? What are the great things about doing business here? Because we have so many. And if you don't have any, I have a list that I can give you that you can promote um, on your social channels and um, in your talks with people. You'd be surprised how many smart folks come through this town um, for conventions all the time and didn't think that we had anything to offer outside yeah. of that four miles of strip. Yeah, so. absolutely. So I love that. I think that's yeah. great. I, I would love to be part of that and help share that. And yeah, spread the word. Help inspire others to talk about what's what's great about Las Vegas and the and the achievements we do have. If, yeah. When I lived here the first time, they said this town could never support a professional sports team, mm -hmm. so don't even bother trying. Mm -hmm. If we can, if in the desert, we can get a hockey team yeah. and win a Stanley Cup, oh, yeah. we can achieve a lot of things in Las Vegas that Absolutely. a lot of people think are impossible. Absolutely, 100%. So. We can do it. All Just right. got to work together. All right. Well, we're all going to be more positive about Las Vegas. Yes. We're spread the word. Please spread the word. Send, send us that list and we'll, I will. we'll, we'll, we, we we'll a post list. it yeah. and, uh, and people can, we can do it like a daily Instagram challenge or something I love like it. that. We can call it, tell me something good. Tell me like something the song. Good. Like the song. Tell me something good. Okay. We don't have the rights to that song. So just be oh, careful. Cut it out. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Caramel sauce and cinnamon aside, <laughs> we as leaders, there's a lot of stress being a leader sometimes. How do you there stay? How do you stay calm and centered without, you know, in the face of adversity, without throwing caramel sauce and cinnamon on people? Yes, um, I think it starts outside of work. So outside of work, I have a pretty uh, stable routine. So like, I wake up, I pray, I meditate, I exercise, I journal. Probably not as much as I should, but I do journal, um, so I can come to work with a clear head mm -hmm. um and also like silence so when there's a lot going on giving myself space and time to like stop think process and then respond which i didn't have that skill set when there was caramel sauce and cinnamon yeah, it, but i have an, it now. another skill set it's hard for people to develop i find myself as i get older appreciating moments of silence mm -hmm. much more often than i used to yeah just giving yourself that time to be quiet. And we talked about listening, right? Like listening to others, but also like listening to yourself, like taking a minute to stop mm -hmm. and listen to yourself is just as important in remaining, um, like even, even this is important. Um, something that I'm working on one of my team members with, they have a tendency, like when things get overwhelming, they can like panic or mm -hmm. just get very stressed out. And I, I fear that sometimes my calm demeanor, I, like scares them like I don't care mm -hmm. because that's also that's important too is I'm pretty calm and there has been moments where Tina has come to me she's like you're not upset and I'm like oh I am I just I there's no way I can react in am, a way I'm cold stone upset I was like I'm very upset actually uh but I'm I will not raise my voice I will not like essentially like throw a tantrum. Like I, I have to, I, I need to be quiet in this moment and I need to stop and think. And that's something that I'm trying to 
allow my team to uh, learn and I'm encouraging them to learn is to give their space, their selves, give themselves that time to like stop and think. That's great advice for all of us, yeah. especially with as fast paced as things yeah. are. Yeah. So speaking of fast paced, yeah. what are you excited about that's coming up in the future for you and LVGEA and the community here? The Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is going to be fun. So we are working with our municipal partners, um, the local cities and the county, along with some of our private partners to bring out a group of companies that we are hoping to attract to our region to set up shop here. And we're leveraging the Super Bowl, which we haven't done before. So this is the first time that the public and private sector has really rallied around economic development in this way and leveraging the assets that we have um, to bring and land what we would call a big fish. So I'm really excited for that coming up. I think the Super Bowl is going to be an incredible opportunity for us to showcase our region's assets. I'm looking forward to that. I think we're all excited, uh, not, yeah. not just for the game itself and the, the fans and all the excitement that's going to bring, but all those other other opportunities that are going to come with that yes. as, as being recognized as an international sports city. Yes. So, all right. So I have a couple more questions for you, but I like to get the housekeeping out of the way before we get to the, the final question. Okay. So what else should we know about Brooke Malone and where can everyone find you and anything else you want them to find? Sure. So what else should you know about me? You know, I am super optimistic about the future and not just like for work, not just for this, um, not even just for this city, but I think the way in the midst of like a lot of turmoil in the world, there are bright spots of togetherness. And I think if all of us could come together and find those bright spots and lean into them, we will be stronger and better together in that way. And I am committed to being one of those folks that has my, not a microscope, what is that thing called? Oh my gosh, I can't think of any of the words. Mechanical pencil? No, like a, like the glass. A magnifying glass? A magnifying glass. I am keen on having um, a magnifying glass to find those bright spots within um, my peers, within my community, around the country, around the world, um, to help us come together and be stronger. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a, that goes with your message of you know we're good at we're good at things here yeah. in Las Vegas too. Let's focus on what we're good at and use yeah. that to inspire us to to tackle some of the things we're struggling with. Sure. And I I don't want to fall into like there's also there's something called like toxic positivity so it's not necessarily like being in la la land and acknowledging that yeah. like turmoil doesn't exist and that there aren't hard things out there however um like those things come to our doorsteps pretty often so i think we have to work a little extra harder yeah. to um find to find the positivity and lean into that so i guess something i would want everyone to know about me is that um you can expect me to like to be the cheerleader be right alongside of you and my community to identify the good stuff and lean into that. We look forward to doing that with you. Yeah. So uh, where can everyone find you? Tell everyone on camera where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, just LinkedIn, Brooke Malone, or I'm on Instagram, Brooke Business. Mm -hmm. That's my handle. Yep. Not hard to find. I'm around. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, two last questions. Sure. And I think we have already kind of talked about this, but okay. someone or something you're grateful for. My mommy. Aww. I love my mommy. She has, um, I love both my parents. My mommy especially has always encouraged me in times of turmoil. She will be the first to check me when I'm tripping. Um, and she, she just always has my back. I love my mommy. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Finally, what is some advice you would give to future leaders, especially young women? Mm-hmm who are either becoming leaders or aspiring to become leaders? Learn as much as you possibly can. Listen as clearly and concisely as much as you possibly can. Pour into others around you while also pouring into yourself. If you can continue to learn 
um, understand what others are thinking, how they're thinking, and help people grow, you will. there will always be a place for you at the table. Always. It's not much you'll have to fight for. Um, there will be times where you have to put up a put up a fight. Um, but if you can always help others be better, you'll be fine. And you, and you, you are a leader if you do that. That is fantastic advice and a great place to leave it. Yeah. Brooke Malone, thank you so much for being here. Thank you here. for having me, Jason. I appreciate you. I'm glad we got to reconnect again. Same. And I'm so glad we got to have this conversation about the future of Las Vegas and Southern Nevada's economy. Yeah. Right. And I want to thank all of you for watching The Leader's Mindset. There's so much going on in the world. Whatever you go do today, make an impact.